Episode 8, The Surplus. But soon the steeples called, good people all, to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their gayest faces. And at the same time there emerged from scores of by streets, lanes, and nameless turnings, innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in a baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on their dinners from his torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled with each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humor was restored directly, for they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day. And so it was. God love it, so it was. In time, the bells ceased, and the bakers were shut up, and yet there was a genial shadowing forth of all these dinners and the progress of their cooking in the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven, where the pavement smoked as if its stones were cooking too. Is there a peculiar flavor in what you sprinkle from your torch? asked Scrooge. There is, my own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? To any kindly given, to a poor one most. Why to a poor one most? Because it needs it most. Spirit, said Scrooge, after a moment's thought, I wonder you, of all the beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I, cried the spirit, you would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often the only day on which they can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge. Wouldn't you? I, cried the spirit, you seek to close those places on the seventh day, said Scrooge. And it comes to the same thing. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I am wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us, and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that, and charge their doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge promised that he would. And they went on, invisible as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost, which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully and like a supernatural creature as it was possible he could have done in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men, that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. For there he went, and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe. And on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled, and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinklings of his torch. This of that, Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt-collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir, in honor of the day, into his mouth, 
rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own. And basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. "'What has ever got your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'And your brother, Tiny Tim. And Martha weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour.' "'Here's Martha, mother,' said a girl, appearing as she spoke. "'Here's, Here's Martha, Martha, mother!' mother cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah! Hurrah! There's, There's such, such a, a goose, goose Martha! Mother. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are! said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious zeal. We'd a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless ye. No, no, no there's father, father coming, coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, hide Martha, Martha hide. hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only a joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit when she had rallied Bob on his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church, because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day, who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire, and while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round, and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course, and in truth it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed potatoes with incredible vigor, Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce, Martha dusted the hot plates, Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, 
and the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife, and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness, were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family, indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone atop the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witnesses, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose someone should have got over the wall of the back yard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose, a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello! A great deal of steam! The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other, with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half of a half a quartern of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding! Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been flat heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all gone, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound in the jug, being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table, and a shovelful of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth, in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning a half a one, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers, and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Which all the family echoed. Go bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side, upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his, as if he loved the child, and wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, kind spirit. Say you will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. 
Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit, and was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is, and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. O oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke, and trembling, cast his eyes upon the ground. But he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Thank you so much for continuing to listen to the story of Scrooge. We ask that you leave us a review on Spotify or a like and a comment on YouTube. Have a Merry Christmas and see you tomorrow.